Thermodynamics 1, Thermochemistry, Constant Pressure Calorimetry. In this tutorial, we will be looking at a definition for calorimetry, constant pressure calorimetry, and a few constant pressure calorimetry example problems. Calorimetry. Calorimetry involves the measurement of thermal energy exchanged between the reaction, defined as the system, and the surroundings by observing the change in temperature of the surroundings. Constant pressure calorimetry. A constant pressure calorimeter measures the change in the enthalpy of a reaction, which we represent as delta H reaction occurring in a solution. The chemical reaction in the calorimeter occurs under constant pressure, so atmospheric pressure. Typically, Styrofoam coffee cup calorimeters are used. A thermometer and a stirrer are inserted through the lid in the calorimeter. The thermometer measures the temperature of the solution, which responds to the heat either absorbed or released by the chemical reaction that occurs within the calorimeter. Constant pressure calorimetry. If the chemical reaction is exothermic, Heat released by the chemical reaction, the system, is absorbed by the solution, the surroundings. The thermal energy lost by the system is gained by the surroundings. So if we look at this image over on the right, we have our stirrer, a thermometer, an insulated stopper, nested insulating cups, and a reaction mixture. Now you can't see the system. The system is the chemical reaction, and of course it's at the particulate level, so we can't see it. We can see the surroundings though. The surroundings is the solution, so the thermometer is measuring the temperature of the solution, and in an exothermic reaction, we would see the temperature increased as measured by the thermometer. If the chemical reaction is endothermic, the chemical reaction, the system, absorbs heat from the solution, the surroundings. The thermal energy gained by the system is lost by the surroundings. So, the chemical reaction that occurs in here absorbs energy. As it absorbs energy from the solution, we'd see a drop in the temperature. So the chemical reaction absorbs energy and as a result, the solution will lose energy and will see a decrease in the temperature. The chemical reaction occurs in a measured quantity of solution within the calorimeter. The mass of the solution is known. If the specific heat capacity of the solution is known, a little c solution, the thermal energy, Q solution, either absorbed or lost from the solution, otherwise known as the surroundings, may be determined with the relationship Q solution equals mass of the solution times the specific heat of the solution times the change in temperature. The insulated calorimeter is assumed to prevent the exchange of thermal energy in or out of the calorimeter. Thus, the heat gained by the solution equals the heat lost by the chemical reaction and vice versa. If heat is absorbed by the calorimeter, the relationship can be written as Q reaction is equal to negative Q solution plus Q cal, where Q cal represents the heat absorbed by the calorimeter. Let's do a few examples. A small coffee cup calorimeter contains 110 grams of water at 22 degrees Celsius. A 100 gram sample of lead is heated to 90 degrees Celsius and then placed in the water. The contents of the calorimeter come to a temperature of 23.9 degrees Celsius. Calculate the specific heat capacity of lead. One thing to note right here is that this 23.9 degrees Celsius is known as our thermal equilibrium temperature. This is the temperature that ultimately results when the temperature of the water increases and the sample of the lead decreases. 
Another way of looking at this thermal equilibrium temperature is that this is going to represent our T final for both the water and the lead. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. The formula that we're going to use for this is the amount of heat, Q, lost by the lead plus the amount of heat gained by the water is going to equal zero. So the amount of heat lost by the lead will equal the negative of the amount of heat gained by the water. Now Q, as we can recall from previous videos, we know Q is equal to MC delta T. So if we take both of these Qs and we replace them with MC delta T, we can use the information that's provided in our prompt. Mass of the lead times the specific heat of the lead, which is what we are looking for, multiplied by the temperature final minus temperature initial of the lead will equal the negative of the mass of the water times the specific heat of the water times temperature final, which we know will be the same for both of them, minus the initial temperature of the water. Wow, that was a lot. Let's take the information from above and plug it in to our formula. So we have an initial mass of lead of 100 grams. We are solving for the specific heat of lead, so I'm gonna call that X. Now our temperature final is 23.9 degrees Celsius. Our initial temperature of the lead was 90 degrees Celsius. And I'm going to make that equal to, now don't forget the negative. Don't forget it. The mass of the water is 110 grams of water. The specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So there's our specific heat. The temperature final is 23.9 degrees Celsius minus the initial temperature of our water of 22.0 degrees Celsius. So I'm solving for the specific heat of lead and if I do all the math and I work out all the calculations, I should get a specific heat of lead that is equal to 0.132 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now remember, specific heat capacity is always a positive value. Let's do another example. A 45 gram block of metal at 99.50 degrees Celsius is dropped into a 150 gram sample of water at 24 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the water rises to 26.40 degrees Celsius. The specific heat of the water is 4.18 joules gram Kelvin. Calculate the specific heat of the metal. So from before, we remember that the heat lost of the metal plus the amount of heat gained by the water will equal zero. So we can rearrange this formula so Q loss of the metal will equal the negative Q gained by the water. And we know that the metal is losing heat because it's at a higher temperature. And we know that the water is gaining heat because it's at an initial lower temperature. Now I'm going to take those Qs and I'm going to replace them with MC delta T, the mass of my metal times the specific heat of my metal times the temperature final minus the temperature initial of my metal will equal the negative mass of my water times the specific heat of the water multiplied by temperature 
final minus temperature initial of the water. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to take all the information from our prompt and plug it into our equation. So the initial mass of the metal is 45 grams. We are solving for the specific heat of the metal. The temperature final for both the metal and the water is 26.4 degrees Celsius. The initial temperature of the metal was given at 99.5 degrees Celsius. That is equal to the negative, and then we have the mass of the water, which was 150 grams of H2O times the specific heat of water, joules per gram degree Celsius, that and that. Our temperature final for both the metal and the water was 26.40 degrees Celsius minus our initial temperature of the water, 24.00 degrees Celsius. And if we work out all the math, solving for the specific heat of the metal, watching our negative, the specific heat of the metal should be 0 0.457 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So what did you learn? We went through the definition for calorimetry. We talked a little bit about constant pressure calorimetry and we did some constant pressure calorimetry example problems. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.